Hello. In this presentation, I try to address the question, can omitted carbon abatement explain productivity stagnation? My name is uh, Timo Kosmanen, and this is a uh, joint work with uh, Sheng Dai and uh, Chun Shao. And it's a presentation uh, prepared for the uh, annual meeting of the Finnish uh, Economic Association. So I will focus mainly on the um, empirical findings and, uh, and the situation in Finland particularly, and I leave the technical details for the for the paper. So let me start with the this kind of uh, figure to illustrate the stagnation of growth in, in Finland. So this is the volume index of the real GDP per capita in Finland uh, from 1975 till the latest year 2022, which is taken from the Statistics Finland website. And as you can see, we had a uh, steady growth of, of real GDP per capita until the uh, about the financial crisis in 2008. And since then, we've had some minor fluctuations, but, but not really any growth since the financial crisis. And this is, of course, a very serious concern for the uh, also for the for the public economy. And uh, and there's a lot of, uh, of course, uh, concern. How how could we then turn this kind of uh, uh, stagnation to a to a growth trend again? Well, the stagnation has been very serious in Finland, but of course, Finland is not the only country where the uh, growth has been slow since the financial crisis. Uh, and uh, and same applies also to the productivity development. Uh, so I have here some some examples of. Uh, uh, recent studies in uh, in Western countries, especially in the top economics journals, and there have been many explanations suggested in the economics literature why this kind of uh, slow growth and uh, and slow productivity growth, particularly, has has taken place. Um, some of these explanations are related, for example, declining business dynamism. Uh, growth of market power and can lead to misallocation of resources, obviously. And we have also all sorts of measurement problems, of course. And and then there is also issues such as aging society or or zero interest rates. But um, anyway, this kind of uh, there is clearly not not some kind of established resolution that uh, that uh, what is really causing the stagnation and how to how to then. Uh, it, this is especially the important question that how how could we then stimulate growth in the future? And in our study, we are arguing that that actually we are still forgetting one important explanation, uh, which relates to the measurement problems, but uh, but not to the economy, not to the digital economy, but rather uh, this relates actually to the Kyoto Protocol, which was quite a lot uh, debated in the late nineteen nineties. And I can still vividly remember uh, when I was assistant professor in the Netherlands in the early 2000s that how this kind of um, uh, inefficient uh, arrangement of the Kyoto Protocol was still very, very much debated at that time. And um, there, are, there were famous uh, economists such as uh, William Nordhaus, which, which were like uh, using their models to, to estimate the economic cost of the, of the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, this was seen to be particularly detrimental for the for the U.S. economy, and uh, perhaps as a result of that, uh, it also happened that the U.S.A. never actually ratified the Kyoto Protocol, and that might also also then then um, explain why why in economics then the interest in the Kyoto Protocol sort of died out in the in the uh, after this uh, initial interest in the late nineties. But if you think about the temporary association, uh, interestingly, the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol then actually coincides with the with the financial crisis period. So, so uh, obviously, it was very easy to meet this kind of commitments of the Kyoto Protocol during the uh, when when the demand dropped uh, in any case. But perhaps partly also the the commitments of the Kyoto Protocol might help to explain why why then for example the eu european economy didn't recover as as uh, quickly as uh, as the us did so if we think about the the mechanism uh, and particularly when we talk about the productivity growth then uh, 
I have here tried to outline that how this kind of uh, uh, Kyoto Protocol or, or energy transition or, or green transition more broadly can affect the measured productivity growth. So obviously, to, to abate the greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions, it has required very massive R&D investment, capital investment, and of course, also, also, also labor input. So all of those uh, capital and labor inputs uh, uh, included uh, it or, or are measured in the in the like system of national accounts uh, will be included, but but they do not really help to increase the the value added or, or GDP. So so in that sense, uh, there we we do measure this on the input side, but not on the output side. So therefore, we would have two possibilities. One would be to try to sort of clean up our input data from this kind of uh, greenhouse gas abatement inputs. Or alternatively, we can adjust our output side and also try to get this kind of uh, changes in the greenhouse gas gases into account. Uh, and this is the approach that we follow in this paper. So we, we, we utilize so-called a green TFP where we also take into account the changes in the greenhouse gas emissions over time. So obviously there are many, many ways to, to um, measure productivity and total factor productivity as well as green TFP. So let me first start with an illustrative example, which is based on the ETLAS uh, study of the Finnish uh, energy industry. So this is very simple exercise based on the, on the growth accounting method. So actually, this uh, this uh, gray line TFP indicated in this figure, it is simply this uh, EU claims uh, total factor productivity measurements, which are based on the on growth accounting. So then these green lines have been uh, composed by simply adding this uh, this uh, greenhouse gas greenhouse gas component with a certain certain price and and. Uh, we could take this kind of OECD benchmark prices. So in this figure, we have used 30 and 60 euros per ton as the price of the, of the greenhouse gases. So as you can see, if you put a uh, put, uh, uh, higher price for the greenhouse gases, then, then the productivity of this energy industry would, would look a uh, look little bit higher. And, and of course, you can think of the gray line as, as this kind of conventional TFP, which implicitly sets the price of zero for the, for the ton of greenhouse gases. So there is also, also then, then, then higher value in, the, in this kind of OECD benchmarks. What if we put 90 euros per, per ton? Then uh, in this figure, it's the same figure, but, but it also includes uh, the case where the, the, the price of CO2 would be uh, 90 euros per ton. And uh, this, of course, already implies very, very huge uh, growth of green TFP if we assign such a high, high value of the, of the greenhouse gas emissions. So one way or another, to have this green TFP, we need to assign some kind of monetary value for those, for those emissions. And that's, in some sense, the big, big challenge. So in, in this study, uh, there was no attempt to, to, to address this, uh, that how this CO2 CO2 uh, price, what, what is the price of the CO2 to be used in this, this kind of exercise? So this is what we then try to address in this uh, present study. So we now move from, from growth accounting to the index number approach, specifically the, the Fisher ideal index. And uh, we, we return to this uh, um, 20 year old paper that, uh, that I published with my co-authors in 2004, where we utilize this so-called uh, shadow price Fisher index. So here, this kind of index number formula, this is just the usual kind of Fisher total factor productivity index. So we have this kind of quantity index of outputs divided by quantity index of uh, inputs. And usually these, these uh, index weights are, are prices. So when we have, uh, when we have a, uh, uh, input prices, output prices, so we can use these prices as the as the index weights. However, obviously, in the case of the CO two emissions, like I mentioned, uh, um, we do not necessarily have some some very very useful price information. Of course, there exist, for example, EU ETS uh, prices, but these are very much uh, policy driven 
uh, prices depend depending on the supply of this uh, these permits. So what we do with this kind of shadow price uh, index, we, we take into account this uh, not only only this uh, good outputs Y, but also bad outputs B, and we utilize so-called shadow prices as index weights instead of this kind of market prices. So therefore, then, then, uh, then um, we we will have this kind of uh, uh, shadow pricing of these of these emissions as built into this uh, index number. And uh, the question then is, where do we get these shadow prices? So if you think about uh, uh, just um, basic uh, introductory economics, uh, then then we can think of this uh, for the input side. We, there there are marginal rates of substitution for our inputs. Uh, specifically labor and capital and then we have marginal rates of transformation for these uh, these outputs both good output and bad output that we have in our our model so then the question is how do we how do we estimate this marginal rates of substitution and marginal rates of transformation so here i don't get to a lot of technical details uh, but in our study we utilize this uh, this kind of convex quantile regression approach uh, proposed in my paper with with Chun Shao a few years ago, where we where we estimate a, a grid of 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 quantiles. We utilize multiple quantiles, and then then we use those quantiles uh, uh, which are based on convex regression. So so we then then have this kind of local estimation of this uh, of these shadow prices, which would be uh, similar to you, if you in this on the right hand side there is this kind of figure with the multiple quantiles of the of the um, uh, output set notice that we have bad output uh, co2 so these output uh, output sets are are shaped this way and we can take then this kind of slope coefficients of these different quantiles nearest to the to the whatever observed data point we have to 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 uh, evaluate those shadow prices and uh, in practice in this study we utilize the python package developed by by my co-author sheng dai and and other others so you can find further technical details of how do we do this shadow pricing and then we in in the paper and then then we basically just plug in these shadow prices to this index number and we calculate this kind of fisher shadow price fisher green tfp measures so then let me move to the application so we have used uh, cross-country data of uh, 38 OECD countries from 1990 to uh, 2019. So the data are based on the Penn World Tables. And uh, we use uh, as outputs, we have GDP as the good output and greenhouse gases as a bad output. We have two inputs, labor and capital. And uh, we include uh, the usual kind of um, uh, labor in, in millions of full-time equivalent but we also consider as an alternative uh, measure of human capital. For the capital, we have both capital stock and then we have also capital services data, which we use as alternative input measures, which we basically use for the for the like robustness check for the for our results. So let me go to the results then, and uh, this figure illustrates for the. For the aggregate of all OECD countries, uh, the yearly growth of TFP, which is uh, a black line, that's the that's the weighted geometric mean of all countries, and then the green dashed line is the green TFP. And as you can see, every in every year during this time period, uh, the green TFP is uh, the, almost every year it is it is somewhat higher than the 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 conventional TFP measured by the Fisher index. And here we see this kind of uh, uh, financial crisis led to the uh, negative uh, productivity development, both in terms of the conventional TFP and the green TFP. So based on this figure, it might seem like uh, it's relatively small impact, but then if we compare the cumulative indices, we see that, uh, that actually in a cumulative fashion, the green TFP has been growing quite uh, quite impressively compared to the conventional TFP, which shows this kind of uh, stagnation of productivity growth also at the aggregate level of the OECD countries when the base year is is uh, nineteen ninety one. 
So we could think about this green TFP actually as a, some kind of counterfactual that uh, what the productivity development might have been if, uh, if we didn't have any kind of uh, uh, abatement required or if, if, uh, if the countries could continue to um, emit uh, greenhouse gases totally freely without any, any, any restrictions. So as you can see, there has been, of course, huge huge productivity growth, not in terms of the conventional TFP, but, but when we take this kind of uh, reduction of the greenhouse gases into account, actually the, the growth looks, looks rather impressive. So at least I find this, this, this figure very, very uh, compelling. We can also, also consider, of course, uh, cross-country differences, which are highlighted by, by, by this figure. So in general, the more the country has abated its greenhouse gas emissions, then the larger the, the green TFP is compared to the, to the actual TFP. There are some countries where, they, where there's no difference whatsoever. And uh, in both, uh, like for example, according to our estimates, Turkey has, has negative growth, both in terms of the, the green TFP and uh, the conventional TFP. But it's importantly, if you look at uh, my country, Finland, uh, the difference between the, the conventional TFP and green TFP growth is, is quite remarkable. And this is because also, also uh, Finland as an EU member state, of course, has, has done a lot to uh, reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. But when we compare to like, like for example, our, our uh, other Nordic countries, our benchmark countries, then, then for example, here we find Sweden, then, uh, then uh, the difference is not, uh, not as, as large. So in fact, in terms of the uh, green TFP growth, uh, Finland's performance has been much more similar to the other Nordic countries than in terms of the, whereas in, in terms of conventional TFP, Finland has been lacking behind the other Nordic countries. So that's, that's also an important important point. So I mentioned about these alternative measures of, of uh, inputs. So this figure compares what if we use human capital instead of number of persons uh, engaged. So uh, this indicates that, uh, that this uh, difference between these alternative uh, productivity measures, if we change the, the, the um, uh, specification of the, of the labor input somewhat, it doesn't make a huge a uh, huge difference to the to the green TFP results. Of course, this uh, this uh, input itself is 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 different. In case of some countries, it does make a make a difference. But but overall, these green TFP measures are, are rather robust to this kind of uh, uh, changes in how the how how specifically the inputs are measured. So uh, here is the summary of our our results. So we have in our study empirically shown that uh, green TFP in the OECD countries has exhibited uh, quite major growth uh, from the 1990s, whereas the conventional TFP has stagnated as, as, we, as we all know. And uh, we believe that this, uh, this uh, greenhouse gas abatement, uh, which is typically omitted in the conventional measures of TFP, and in, in the like discussion of economic growth. Um, so that can also, also help to explain why this stagnation has, has occurred. So in some sense, this stagnation was very much anticipated already in the late 90s when there was discussion of what, the, what are the impacts of the Kyoto Protocol. And of course, there has been also a lot of progress in the, in the abatement of the greenhouse gas emissions so instead of having this kind of gloomy, pessimistic uh, view of the economic stagnation, perhaps it is time to uh, time to recognize first of all that there has been progress. It's not just uh, well captured in the in the GDP, and perhaps when comparing to this kind of uh, very pessimistic view of the of the late nineties, maybe it is actually helpful to appreciate that our living standards did not really collapse uh, uh, too badly, despite this kind of rather cost ineffective implementation of the of the Kyoto protocol so looking a little bit uh, in the future the finnish government has um, uh, set very ambitious targets to achieve uh, 
um, net zero uh, to, to become um, carbon neutral by year 2035. And obviously this will require further investment and innovation for the over the next 10 years at least. So, but then of course, uh, uh, we do not have to implement this kind of energy transition uh, many times if we, if we carry it uh, at this time. So in the longer term, of course, this kind of transition at some point will be will be will be over and, and come to an end. Uh, and then also then our resources can be can be then then uh, again targeted more to the to the economic growth. So this is particularly why why I think it is important to understand that, what is the role of this uh, this greenhouse gas abatement uh, um, uh, slowing down the the economic economic growth, and uh, and also, I do not say that that, that I mean I be, we do believe that uh, that uh, this kind of abatement of greenhouse gases has been necessary in Finland. It's also necessary also in other countries around the world. Uh, so the message should not be that that uh, we should uh, we should then um uh, stop doing that in contrast we should just uh, just uh, recognize its role in the in the economic growth thank you very much for your attention and bye bye